Here I will be continuing my coverage on molecularity of S in reactions. What I have covered so far is the difference between SN1 and SN2 and the factors that can help us determine if it's SN1 or SN2. I initially started with nucleophile strength and proceeded with the saying that weak nucleophiles are likely to perform SN1 and strong nucleophiles are likely to perform SN2. Then, after that, we looked into the alpha carbon of the substrate and concluded that for SN2, the most likely types of alpha carbons are methyl and primary carbons, but for SN1, it's tertiary. And for secondary carbocations or secondary alpha carbons, it can go either way. It depends on other factors. So, there's another factor that we can look at other than the nucleophile strength and the alpha carbon, and that is the solvent. This is not as commonly discussed, but is significant also. So let's start. Take note that, in general, we have two choices for solvents in most reactions. Those are nonpolar solvents and polar solvents. Do remember that since we are dealing with substituted alkanes RL, wherein L could be a variety of functional groups, like those of alcohols, thiols, ethers, this is going to give us a dipole, right? And therefore, in general, an RL is polar. So that means the only things that can dissolve this are similarly polar compounds. So that already tells you that nonpolar solvents are not good choices for reactions involving SN. So that means that all solvents we need for nucleophilic substitution reactions are automatically polar. But it's a matter of knowing if the polar solvent you're using is protic or aprotic. When you say protic, it is something that can release protons or H plus ions. A protic, A, meaning none, meaning that aprotic solvents do not release protons. And of course, the question that can naturally come up after I mention this is, what's so important about protons in this type of reaction? Of course, it is something that we do need to answer. And so, let's try to imagine, again, once again, the difference between SN1 and SN2. As I recall, remember that when we compare the relative powers or strengths of the nucleophile and the leaving group, in SN1, the nucleophile is supposedly weaker than the leaving group, meaning if we're talking about the relative negative charges, we can imagine for SN1, the nucleophile is only a little negative, but the leaving group is somehow bigger. But for SN2, we say we use strong nucleophile, so here the tables are turned, the nucleophile has a larger negative charge, and we can imagine the leaving group is smaller in terms of the negative charge. And the idea is, whichever of the two has a greater negative charge, they are more attracted to the protons released by a solvent in case that the solvent is protic. So I'm trying to say here that for SN1, the leaving group is the one that will go to our proton, but for SN2, it is the nucleophile that will go to the proton. Let's try to examine what the impact of that would give to our reactions. In SN1, I just said that the leaving group is the one that will look for protons. If that is the case, we can imagine the leaving group here, still attached to the substrate, and the leaving group will try to find the proton, if there is a proton. And if that happens, the moment that the leaving group finds the protons, it will make the leaving group even more satisfied with this H, giving it more reasons to separate from the R. I'm trying to say here that what the proton actually did in SN1 was that it increased the probability of the leaving group leaving. And isn't that what we want to happen for SN1? Because the only time that the nucleophile can enter is when the leaving group leaves. In short, the reaction becomes faster actually, or we can say in general this is good, if I have an SN1 reaction. I like protons in SN1 reactions. But for SN2, let's see how it goes. Remember, I just told you that in SN2 reactions, the nucleophile is the one that will seek the H plus ions, if there are H plus ions. Imagine my nucleophile here. 
Its goal in SN2 is to attack the substrate and force the living group to leave. But let's say that the nucleophile finds this proton before it even finds the R. This would be way attracted to the proton. And so what would happen is that, you know, the nucleophile, if, if it was like a human being, it would be, oh, proton, you're so attractive. I'm going to go to you instead. Uh, I mean, imagine what would happen if that happens or what if that is the case. If the nucleophile bonds with the proton, then therefore your product is the nucleophile bonded to the H. Then I'm going to ask the question, will the nucleophile ever have a chance to attack this R if it already attaches to the H plus? Of course not. That means what the H is doing here is, is, is that it's distracting the nucleophile from getting to our R in the first place. Again, let me say that it's a distraction here. You're not supposed to be here. Because if you're here, the nucleophile will go to you instead of the substrate. And therefore, no reaction will happen already. So therefore, this is bad. You do not want protons in SN2. Therefore, we can already make the proper matching. So that means that I said protons are good for SN1. Therefore, I want protic solvents for SN1. Or for SN2, I do not want protons, so I need solvents that are aprotic. Of course, one more thing that we need to take note of are the common examples of these solvents. So common examples of protic solvents are, well, water, acids, alcohols, and etc. Whereas, common examples of aprotic solvents are THF, tetrahydrofuran, dimethyl formamide, dimethyl sulfoxide, and acetone. Take note that although I wish to write the meaning of the initials here or the acronyms here, I have no space. So maybe I could type it in the description section if you want to know the meaning of these letters. So now, hopefully when you watch the previous video, you remember that we did some practice in terms of SN1 versus SN2. And we already have answers, as you see. Now, when we answered this in the previous discussion, we only looked at two factors, the nucleophile type, if it's weak or strong, and the alpha carbon, whether it's methyl, primary, secondary, or tertiary. But now, equipped with the knowledge that we have for the solvent, we can also use the solvent, if the solvent is written in the equation, to help us further Make sure or double check that our answer is correct. For example, I see here DMSO. Is it protic or aprotic? It's aprotic. And if it's aprotic, which type of SN would prefer aprotic? SN2, right? So that even further confirms our answer a while ago, which was SN2. How about H+. Remember that when I see H+, it's the indication that I have a proton donor I'm referring to acids. And what type of solvent is an acid? Of course, we know based on, on basic definitions of acids, they're proton donors, they're protic. And therefore, that's SN1. So that double checks our answer here. How about acetone? Protic or aprotic? It's aprotic, right? So aprotic means it should be SN2, aprotic, SN2. So now you have three ways to check if your SN is SN1 or SN2. Not just the nucleophile, not just the alpha carbon, but also the solvent used. Though you have to take note, in some quiz questions, the solvent may deliberately be erased in order to force you to look at other factors. Okay, So you need to be flexible and know all of these three. The final thing that we will discuss about SN1 versus SN2 is reaction stereochemistry. Now, this is where the importance of hybridization lies. Remember in the very, very, very first discussion of SN, I made it clear that the alpha carbon that we have is an sp3 carbon? Yeah, because remember that once you have an sp3 carbon, that is already a candidate. It can be possibly chiral. If I have four different substituents, as you would remember from our discussion in isomers. So, let's say that I have an optically active compound. Let's say I have a chiral compound that is an RL compound also. 
wherein I have this alpha carbon attached to 1, 2, 3, and 4, four different substituents. And let's say that substituent 1 is our leaving group. Would SN1 and SN2 give us different isomers? Let's see. First, our task right now is to look at this compound and assign its isomerism. Hopefully, you remember how to do this. So, remember, your first job is to rank the priority of the four substituents, which for purpose of faster discussion, I already used numbers instead of actual compounds. And we know that in order to know if this is an R or an S configuration, you need to rotate from 1 to 2 to 3. So 1 to 2 to 3 is a clockwise spin, and hopefully you remember that means that our starting material is an R isomer. Now, remember in SN1, the first step involves the leaving of the leaving group, right? So we can imagine 1 taking away its electrons and going away. And remember, in SN1, it's very characteristic to see a carbocation. Remember that the carbocation has an sp2 hybridization. That's why you see that the bonds here are all in the same plane because it's flat. And the remaining substituents are 2, 3, and 4. Let's say that my nucleophile starts to come in. So I'm putting my symbol as 1 prime for the nucleophile. And I'm trying to show you here two possible ways that our nucleophile can enter. Let's say that you can imagine this being on the plane of the screen, right? Let's say that there is a possibility for our 1 prime to go at the back. Can you imagine? Let's say it's going at the back of your screen and it's attacking my carbon from behind. If that happens, how will the arrangement of the substituents look like after? Well, if you imagine one being here at the back, then that means that I should also put one here. And that means 2, 3, and 4 will stay at front unchanged. Okay? Or there's a possibility that my nucleophile, can you imagine? Imagine that this one is going on front of your screen and then it attacks the carbocation at the front. If that happens, then my one is supposed to be at the front and one of these two, either number two or number four, I'll just choose four, will be pushed to the back. So once my one goes at the front, my 4, you can imagine, is pushed to the back like so. The 2 stays here and 3 stays here. Now, therefore, I actually have two possible products, given that I can attack both the back and the front. So, what's the configuration of this one? The spin from 1 to 2 to 3 is clockwise, so, well, it's still R. There's a word for that. If the R isomer is still an R isomer after the reaction. The phenomenon is called retention, meaning the R was retained. How about this one? Remember, you cannot assign the R or S configuration unless 4 is at the back. So we need to imagine 4 going at the back, and we already did a little practice of this in our discussion of isomers way before. That is, you can imagine spinning this such that 4 goes to the back. If I do that, one will go to the front and this two will go to the other side and therefore it will look like this. The, th the three is still on top. Four will now go at the back, one will be here and two will be here. Now four is at the back so we can now make our spin. One to two to three. As you see, it's actually counterclockwise now. And if the spin is counterclockwise, the configuration of this is therefore S. In this case, the process is called inversion. So I can say that in the color blue scenario, the R isomer has been inverted to the S uh, configuration in my product. And therefore, I'm trying to say here that SN1 gives us a mixture, a mixture of inverted products and reta retained products in a ratio of 50-50 or 1 is to 1. There is a real a name for this process, and the combination of both these is called racemization. That is why in the first place, I think I mentioned this a few videos ago, 
when you say racemate or racemic mixture, it's a mixture of enantiomers or RNS isomers, right? And therefore, the process which actually gives us a combination of RNS isomers is also the word racemic. In this case, we make it into a process, so we now use the word racemization. But for SN2, it's an entirely different scenario. There's only one possibility. Remember, I told you that you can imagine in SN, our substrate is being competed for by the leaving group and the nucleophile. Therefore, remember that the leaving group and the nucleophile are both negative, and we know that these two things don't like each other, uh, not, not at all, uh, not even close. And in SN2, we do recall that in SN2, what's happening is that the nucleophile will target the R and will for force the leaving group to leave. But I also remember saying to you that in SN2, we have what we call a backside attack. Let's try to make sense of that. Knowing that my leaving group and nucleophile are both electronegative specimens, I don't want this to be close to this in the first place, right? So maybe if the nucleophile is going to attack this carbon, this is going to try to attack the carbon at a certain angle such that this thing won't recognize it. And what better angle to do that than the angle where this one is not seeing this? I'm talking about the back. So that's the meaning of the backside attack. The fact that the nucleophile needs to be at a distance from the leaving group means that there is no better position for the nucleophile to attack my alpha carbon except at the back, which justifies the meaning of the word backside attack. And if that is the case, my leaving group will now be kicked out from the uh, formula. Um, no asterisk. My one would go out, the leaving group will go out, and now what can we imagine happening in the remaining portion of this molecule? Remember I did say that the nucleophile attacks the back? Remember, 4 was the one at the back. So, it's like saying, the nucleophile's going at the back, and therefore, it's, if, if it's going to occupy the back, the one which was at the back will be forced to adjust going to the front. So therefore, the nucleophile is now the new thing at the back, and this 4 will be pushed and forced to go in front. Oh, by the way, let's say let's use the same uh, symbol, 1 prime. So let me use 1 here. And then 3 and 2 will stay there. So what uh, configuration do we have here? Okay, before and after. If you see the before, it's this one is the same as this one, so it's also R. What can you say about the product now? Remember, we cannot yet assign this as R or S because 4 is still in front. So once again, we need to spin this. Oh wait, maybe we can just look at the color blue here? It's the same, right? So therefore, my product is actually S. So that means that in SN2, the only possibility is R becoming S. How's that called again? Yep, inversion. Therefore, in SN2, you expect a 100% inversion of configuration. All my R will become S, or all my S will become R isomers. So once again, what are the keywords? SN1, racemization. SN2, inversion. And that's very important, especially if you're a chemist or a synthetic chemist, because sometimes you have to recognize the importance of isomers in terms of what you really want to achieve. Yeah, especially for medicines, you have to remember that some drugs work only in a particular configuration. And so these very technical de details become critical in case of drug discovery. So I hope that this would help you understand the inner workings of nucleophilic substitution.